Hi everybody, Miss LeBeau here for our Gnome Home and Fairy Garden Friday. Today we are going to start out simple. We are going to talk about different types of fairy gardens, um, gnome homes, and the different types you can make, the materials we may be using, and I think, if you would like, we are going to uh, make our own little gnome or fairy. So let's take a look at the things that we're going to be using. Okay, this is one of my tables I have set up. On it is the paper that was included in the bag uh, that were handed out at the library and the tiny little bag marked Fairy Garden. There was one of these and one of these in the summer reading program bag. If you still need one or could use one, you can decide that after you look at everything that I've had, you may call or stop by the library. We are open daily from 10 to four. So I have over here the items that were in the Fairy Garden bag, which are some extra things I have are the beads. And over here, the extra thing is tiny rubber bands. We'll get to that. So all these items that are here are actually in one or two of them, obviously. It's very small. Over here, we have um, popsicle sticks, plain and colored, straws. Now these are larger straws. These wonderful straws that are extremely bendy and can be bent every which way. Actually, I haven't been there in a while, but Bob Evans. So we have rubber bands, the smaller rubber bands. These are kind of plastic toothpicks. Um, the straws that are in your bag, uh, the little clothespins, which today we are going to be using a clothespin to make our fairy or gnome. And I have some glass beads, some white rock. I have flowers. Um, these actually were one of the things I bought at Michael's. I think 60, 70% off. I pulled off the actual flower part and leaves on one, left the other one intact, but I will probably be cutting the stems down. On the paper, it just gives you ideas, items to gather, um, what you want to use for your container. It can be anything. For instance, over here, I have some tin cans. I am going to take those three, hot glue them together, maybe spray paint them. I don't know, you'll have to wait and find out. Funny enough, a cup carrier. Yes, I envisioned that I could stuff this with some brown packing paper that you get. Over here, I have mason jars. Our last week, I have planned that we're going to be using a mason jar or the best kind of jar really is like a, a mayonnaise jar. Plastic, plastic lid. We will be putting some paper or lining the inside. It's gonna be very easy, but it's gonna be your very own gnome gnome light or fairy light for in your bedroom at night. Here, I have what they call fairy lights. You know, the little bendy kind. This one is actually battery operated. Or you could get the uh, little tea lights. Okay. I have the yarn over here, TP, PT rolls. Those were not included, nor were the sticks. But again, I think if you go on a hunt, you should be able to find sticks fairly easily. Another thing that fairies love, or just awesome for fairies, are Altoid containers. And this, let me show you why. If you open that up, it's the perfect size for a fairy bed. Yes, absolutely. And there are some for larger gnomes or fairies, for some teeny tiny fairies. And then we have the flip top, the flip top, yep, like a sleeping bag. They can just crawl in there and snooze. It's like their little pillow. Today, I have this, I thought it was kind of funny. It says bark like the, you know, the bark on a tree. Um, actually, it's one of my dog's shamrock. It's his, one of his bowls that, to be honest, it's never been used. Um, yes, I have tool in there, but I'm going to actually put something in there and it might be dirt but I'm going to make this a fairy garden and I am actually going to not even use a container. I am going to be using, over here I have a cake round, a cake round. Brown on one side, white on the other. I've used them probably many times in the library for crafts and activities. The other thing we may, you may need or use is a paper plate, cupcake liners, coffee filters, 
again, anything that I have is not absolutely essential or necessary. Everything that you see is an idea. And I will tell you, I get my best ideas from guess who? You. And that is what makes it awesome. Absolutely awesome. I think we should get into making, making our gnome home fairy garden base and a gnome or a fairy. Okay, so now I have my items laid out on the table and we are going to begin to work on our um, gnome or our fairy first. So let's go. So here are the items that I may or may not use in making my gnome or fairy. This is our bag that has some of the items in it. Again, you may call or stop by the library. I believe we have some left over. I have fuzzy sticks. I know in your, in your little bag, you got one little piece of silver and I'm going to use that. You also got a length of string. I brought some of my own ribbon. And also one thing, cupcake liner, coffee filter, cotton ball, scissors. I do have a marker on one of mine. I am going to try to make a little face, draw it myself. And these are the things that are going to be used uh, to make our fairy or gnome. So I started my first gnome. You have this clothespin in the little bag. Any clothespin, again, you can use a popsicle stick if you have any of those. People have even made them just from um, pipe cleaners as well. I gave him purple pants, a green hat, and this is the piece that you uh, had received. And I am just going to wrap this around very simply for a shirt. So he has a sparkly shirt and I do have a black marker. Let's see how this goes. Oh, not too bad, huh? Hmm. An eyes and a nose. Hmm. I think I'm not going to make a mouth. I think he's just going to have an eyes and a nose. Or maybe that's eyes and a mouth. There you go. All I did was wrap around pipe cleaners, or as I call them, fuzzy sticks, chenille sticks. Another thing that you could do, we could pull off the tiniest piece and glue that on. And now our gnome has a little beard. Let's put him aside. In the bag was a length of this string. It's, it's multicolored. And actually this was an item that was bought at Michael's. Michael's always has a uh, like 30 or 40, sometimes 50. Uh, percent off a regular priced item. So it's really actually a good deal. I'm going to take my red popsicle stick. Now I could make this her hair. I'm thinking that that's what I'm going to do. I don't want her hair to be too long. I think I'm going to give her kind of a ponytail look. I personally think that doing this is a really a great opportunity to be something the family does together. So something I've decided to do, I'm having a little bit of difficulty getting my, getting my hair onto my little fairy. I'm going to put the two ends together and make a little knot there. So it kind of sticks together and a little bit easier for me to handle. Okay. So let's try this again. I'm, I am simply going to just tie it in the back. You know what, maybe she'll have pigtails. I don't know. I just, you know, it's all, it's all about using your imagination. So there we go. So yeah, she's got some crazy hair, right? Tool is another thing that I've seen used that would be so easy just to put around there. You know, you could even tie it with some ribbon, some string. Actually, what I'm thinking is that I was just going to use it to make the wings for my fairy. I am going to clip some of this and I am going to clip some of the white. Again, you can use yarn, you can use fuzzy sticks. I think I'm actually going to do both. Tiny little bit of pink in there for her fairy wings. Okay, so we'll put that on like so. That's her wings. 
one thing that I did see that people did was you can take, you can either simply poke a hole through here. I suspect for me personally, it would probably fall down all the time. So I've got the tiniest bit of glue, uh, craft glue in, <laughs> that is the tiniest bit, isn't it? In an old ice cream cup. I love to save these. I actually put them in the dishwasher, boom. Use them for lots and lots of things at the library. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just put some glue and you know, I make it up as I go along and that's what it's about, right? It's about being creative. Can you see that? Using your imagination, I am going to put that around like that and just kind of bring it together in the back. Bring it together a little bit in the back. I think I like that more's wings. Now I'm torn. Should they be wings or should they be her little skirt? I think I'm gonna leave it as her little skirt. You know, we'll be able to poke it out and around. So there, there is a popsicle stick fairy. Here is a teeny tiny clothespin gnome. I think he's kind of cute. There's our little fairy. So there we go. One gnome, one fairy. You don't have to make them. You can totally use these items for something else along the way. Some people make their own. Um, some people buy their own. So these are some items that, yes, I found at the Dollar Tree. And there you can see there are three gnomes for a dollar. However, it looks like these are super duper hard to come by. And these are just little decorations to put in your fairy garden. They say that real fairies are teeny, teeny, tiny. Let us move on to our base. All right. So I've placed my items out that I am going to be using for our base, for our fairy garden. And yes, this is called a cake round. And it's not a container, it's flat. And I'm going to use this to make the base of my fairy garden. You could cut out, it's, it's really just cardboard in the shape of a circle. I'm going to use the brown side because it kind of reminds me of dirt. And this time I am just using school glue. I place some in, yes, one of my little ice cream cups and I'm actually going to paint it on. Paint with glue. It's kind of a cool thing. I'm going to Paint that on. Let's take some of this wonderful moss. Maybe I need to be a little more generous with my glue. What do you think? You think I need more glue? More glue, more glue? Yeah, because I really want this to kind of look, you know, pretty full. There we go. Yeah, let's do that. And a little at a time. That's my suggestion. You may do it however you like. So as I'm going along here, I've decided I think we need to be super generous with the glue. Oh, look at what's in there. Oh, that's a treasure. Oh my goodness. Fairies love treasures. Now I should be talking more about the fairies and gnomes because one term is a borrower. There is a book and it is called The Borrowers. It is actually an older book. Some people say that it is a classic. I didn't read it when I was a child or anything, but it's called The Borrowers by Mary, Mary Norton. And this is actually just one in a series of, I think, four books. So let me quickly see. This is the story of Arietti, The Borrowers. This book was cataloged here in 1988. It looks like it was originally written in 1952. So I'm almost done putting on my moss. It's a lot of glue. And yep, you see what I'm doing? <laughs> I'm actually just pouring it right on there. Another thing I chose to use on this, um, the brown side, the white side is shiny. So I kind of thought, hmm, I think a better chance that it will stick really nicely on, on this side. I'm pretty happy with how this is going so far. I found some treasures. I found some sticks. I found another tiny little um, pine cone. I'm going to add those in on here as well with some glue. 
I thought maybe I'd put it, ooh, I think I like that. I don't know if you can see in here, it's really catching the light because fairies and gnomes are attracted to things that are shiny. The other thing I have, and you did get some of this in the packs and the little fairy bags, is some white rock. So I'm just gonna pick a couple pieces. I'm just going to put it over here. I don't even know what it's gonna be yet. I haven't decided but I wanna jazz up. I wanna jazz up my space just a little bit with some color. So there we go. I'm gonna put those right in there. Oops. A little rock pile, a little rock garden maybe. You know what? I'm gonna stick the pine cones right there and maybe stick my other pine cone over here. There we go. Awesome. Put a stick there too. Here. So this is what I have so far. I put the stick in there, just a couple little things just to get started. I think I'm gonna put my, my little gnome. I think this will be a great spot for a gnome home with this. But to be quite honest, I really kind of like the way this looks. And I came across something else, I uh, don't have it with me today, um, that I thought I might use as something really cool for a fairy garden. But look, it's just, it's tool. You know, if you had some uh, nice tissue paper, does it look yummy enough to eat? I don't think we want to eat the tool, do we? Okay, whoops. And, oh look, that looks kind of cute. It's like she's flying. Oh, this is probably a better, better angle. It's like she's flying. So there, look, see, she fits perfectly. So the gnome home and our fairy garden, our base, our start. All right, kiddos. I know this was probably not exactly fun fun today. It was just getting started. Next week, we are going to be outside around my house and we are going to be looking for items to put into our gnome home and fairy gardens. So I hope you look forward to that and Shamrock will be there too. So you'll get to see the pupper again. Hey there, everyone. Um, during my first episode, I spoke about the book called The Borrowers. And being the story time, Mother Goose, um, children's program coordinator that I am, it's too tempting to not share this book with you. So at the end of every video, I am going to be reading a couple chapters. They are nice. I will say these first two chapters will seem a bit lengthy in comparison to some of the others. Some of the others are extremely short. So this first reading, is probably gonna be 20-ish minutes in and of itself. However, I don't anticipate that every reading every week will be that long. I will be doing them on Fairy Garden Fridays. It's about a girl called Arietti, and she is a borrower. She is tiny like a fairy. It is about her and her family. Chapter one. Mrs. May lived in two rooms in Kate's parents' house in London. She was, I think, some kind of relation. Her bedroom was on the first floor and her sitting room was a room which, as part of the house, was called the breakfast room. Now, breakfast rooms are all right in the morning when the sun streams in on the toast and marmalade, but by afternoon, they seem to vanish a little and to fill with a strange silvery light, their own twilight. There is a kind of sadness in them but as a child, it was a sadness Kate liked. She would creep into Mrs. She would creep into, excuse me, she would creep into Mrs. May just before tea time and Mrs. May would teach her to crochet. Mrs. May was old, her joints were stiff and she was not strict exactly, but she had that inner certainty which does instead. Kate was never wild with Mrs. May, nor untidy, nor self-willed, and Mrs. May taught her many things besides crochet. How to wind wool into an egg-shaped ball, how to run and fell and plan a darn, how to tidy a drawer and to lay, like a blessing, 
above the contents, a sheet of rustling tissue against the dust. What's your work, child? Asked Mrs. May one day when Kate sat hunched and silent upon the hassock. You mustn't sit there dreaming. Have you lost your tongue? No, said Kate, pulling at her shoe button. I've lost the crochet hook. They were making a bed quilt in woolen squares. There were 30 still to do. I know where I put it, she went on hastily. I put it on the bottom shelf of the bookcase just beside my bed. On the bottom shelf, repeated Mrs. May, her own needle flicking steadily in the firelight. Near the floor? Yes, said Kate, but I looked on the floor, under the rug, everywhere. The wool was still there though, just where I'd left it. Oh dear, exclaimed Mrs. May lightly. Don't say they're in this house too. That what are, asked Kate. The borrower, said Mrs. May, and in the half light, she seemed to smile. Kate stared a little fearfully. Are there, are there such things? She asked after a moment. As what? As people, other people, living in a house who borrow things? Mrs. May laid down her work. What do you think? She asked. I don't know, Kate said pulling hard at her shoe button. There can't be. And yet, she raised her head, and yet sometimes I think there must be. Why do you think there must be? Asked Mrs. May. Because of all the things that disappear. Safety pins, for instance. Factories go on making safety pins. And every day, people go on buying safety pins. And yet, somehow, there is never a safety pin when you want one. Where are they now? Now at this minute, where do they go? Take needles, she went on, all the needles my mother ever bought. There must be hundreds, just can't be lying about this house. Not lying about the house, no, agreed Mrs. May. And all the other things we keep on buying again and again and again, like pencils and matchboxes and sealing wax and hairpins and drawing pins and thimbles and hat pins, put in Mrs. May, and blotting paper. Yes, blotting paper, agreed Kate, but not hat pins. That's where you're wrong, said Mrs. May, and she picked up her work again. There was a reason for hat pins. Kate stared. A reason, she repeated. I mean, what kind of reason? Well, there were two reasons, really. A hat pin is a very useful weapon. And, Mrs. May laughed suddenly, but it all sounds such nonsense. And, she hesitated, it was so very long ago. But tell me, said Kate, tell me how you know about the hat pin. Did you ever see one? Mrs. May threw her a startled glance. Well, yes, she began. Not a hat pin, exclaimed Kate impatiently. A whatever you call them, a borrower. Mrs. May drew a sharp breath. No, she said quickly, I never saw one. But someone else saw one, cried Kate, and you know about it. I can see you do. Hush, said Mrs. May. No need to shout. She gazed downwards at the upturned face and then she smiled and her eyes slid away into the distance. I had a brother, she began uncertainly. Kate knelt upon the hassock and he saw them? I don't know, said Mrs. May shaking her head. I don't know. She smoothed out her work upon her knee. He was such a tease. He told us so many things, my sister and me, impossible things. He was killed, she added gently, many years ago now on the Northwest frontier. He became Colonel of his regiment. He died what they call a hero's death. Was he your only brother? Yes, and he was our little brother. 
I think that was why she thought for a moment, still smiling to herself. Yes, why he told us such impossible stories, such strange imaginings. He was jealous, I think, because we were older and because we could read better. He wanted to impress us. He wanted, perhaps, to shock us. And yet, she looked into the fire. There was something about him, perhaps because we were brought up in India among mystery and magic and legend, something that made us think that he saw things that people could not see. Sometimes we'd know he was teasing, but at other times, well, we were not so sure. She leaned forward and in her tidy way, brushed a fan of loose ashes under the grate. Then, brush in hand, she stared again at the fire. He wasn't a very strong little boy. The first time he came home from India, he got rheumatic fever. He missed a whole term at school and was sent away to the country to get over it, to the house of a great aunt. Later, I went there myself. It was a strange old house. She hung up the brush on its brass hook and dusting her hands on her handkerchief, she picked up her work. Better light the lamp, she said. Not yet, begged Kate, leaning forward. Please go on, please tell me. But I've told you. No, you haven't. This old house, wasn't that where he saw, he saw? Mrs. May laughed. Where he saw the borrowers? Yes, that's what he told us. What he'd have us believe. And what's more, it seems that he didn't just see them, but that he got to know them very well. That he became part of their lives, as it were. In fact, you might almost say that he became a borrower himself. Oh, do tell me. Please, try to remember right from the very beginning. But I do remember, said Mrs. May. Oddly enough, I remember it better than many real things which have happened. Perhaps it was a real thing. I just don't know. You see, on the way back to India, my brother and I had to share a cabin. My sister used to sleep with our governess and on those very hot nights, often we couldn't sleep and my brother would talk for hours and hours, going over old ground, repeating conversations, telling me details again and again, wondering how they were and what they were doing. And they, who were they exactly? Homily, Pod, and little Arietti. Pod? Yes, even their names were never quite right. They imagined they had their own names, quite different from human names. But with half an ear, you could tell they were borrowed. Even Uncle Hendrieri's and Eglatina's. Everything they had was borrowed. They had nothing of their own at all, nothing. In spite of this, my brother said they were touchy and conceited and thought they owned the world. How do you mean? They thought human beings were just invented to do the dirty work. Great slaves put there for them to use. At least that's what they told each other. But my brother said that underneath, he thought they were frightened. It was because they were frightened, he thought, that they had grown so small. Each generation had become smaller and smaller and more and more hidden. In the olden days, it seems, and in some parts of England, our ancestors talked quite openly about the little people. Yes, said Kate, I know. Nowadays, I suppose, Mrs. May went on slowly, if they exist at all, you would only find them in houses which are old and quiet and deep in the country and where the human beings live to a routine. Routine is their safeguard. They must know which rooms are to be used and when. They do not stay long where, they, where there are careless people or unruly children or certain household pets. This particular old house, of course, was ideal. Although as far as some of them were concerned, 
a trifle cold and empty. Great Aunt Sophie was bedridden through a hunting accident some 20 years before. And as for other human beings, there was only Mrs. Driver the cook, Crampfer the gardener, and at rare intervals, an odd housemaid or such. My brother too, when he went there after the rheumatic fever, had to spend long hours in bed. And for those first weeks, it seems the borrowers did not know of his existence. He slept in the old night nursery beyond the schoolroom. The schoolroom at that time was sheeted and shrouded and filled with junk. Odd trunks, a broken sewing machine, a desk, a dressmaker's dummy, a tablet, some chairs, and a disused pianola. As the children who had used it, great aunt Sophie's children, had long since grown up, married, died, or gone away. The night nursery opened out of the schoolroom, and from his bed, my brother could see the oil painting of the Battle of Waterloo, which hung above the schoolroom fireplace, and on the wall, a corner cupboard with glass doors, in which was set out on hooks and shelves, a doll's tea service, very delicate and old. At night, if the schoolroom door was open, he had a view down the lighted passage which led to the head of the stairs. And it would comfort him to see, each evening at dusk, Mrs. Driver appear at the head of the stairs and cross the passage carrying a tray for Aunt Sophie with bath Oliver biscuits and the tall cut glass decanter of fine old pale Madeira. On her way out, Mrs. Driver would pause and lower the gas jet in the passage to a dim blue flame and then he would watch her as she stumped away down the stairs, sinking slowly out of sight between the banisters. There is a picture, not many pictures in this book, but I believe that's Mrs. Driver. She's turning out the lamp on the wall, as was stated. And I think this is the top of the stairway, top of the stairway that she's going to go down. Under this passage in the hall below, there was a clock and through the night, he would hear it strike the hours. It was a grandfather clock and very old. Mr. Frith of Leighton Buzzard came each month to wind it as his father had come before him and his great uncle before that. For 80 years, they said, and to Mr. Frith's certain knowledge, it had not stopped. And as far as anyone could tell, for as many years before that, the great thing was that it must never be moved. It stood against the wall and the stone flags around it had been washed so often that a little platform, my brother said, rose up inside. And under this clock, below that wall, there was a hole. Chapter two. It was a pod's hole. The excuse me, the keep of his fortress, the entrance to his home. Not that his home was anywhere near the clock, far from it, as you might say. There were yards of dark and dusty passageway with wooden doors between the joists and metal gates against the mice. Pod used all things, excuse me, all kinds of things for these gates. A flat leaf of a folding cheese grater, the hinged lid of a small cash box, squares of pierced zinc from an old meat safe, a wire fly swatter. Not that I'm afraid of mice, homily would say, but I can't abide the smell. In vain, Arietti had begged for a little mouse of her own, a blind mouse to bring up by hand, like Eglatina had. But homily would bang with the pan lids and exclaim, and look what happened to Eglatina. What, Arietti would ask, what did happen to Eglatina? But no one would ever say. It was only Pod who knew the way through the intersecting passages to the hole under the clock. And only Pod could open the gates. There were complicated clasps made of hairpins and safety pins 
of which Pod alone knew the secret. His wife and child led more sheltered lives in home-like apartments under the kitchen, far removed from the risks and dangers of the dreaded house above. But there was a grating in the brick wall of the house, just below the floor level of the kitchen above, through which Arietti could see the garden, a piece of graveled path and a bank where crocus bloomed in spring, where blossom drifted from an unseen tree, and where later an azalea bush would flower, where birds came and pecked and flirted and sometimes fought. The hours you waste on them birds, Homily would say, and when there's a little job to be done, you can never find the time. I was brought up in a house, Homily went on, where there wasn't no grating and we were all the happier for it. Now go off and get me the potato. That was the day when Arietti, rolling the potato before her from the storehouse down the dusty lane under the floorboards, kicked it ill-temperedly so that it rolled rather fast into their kitchen where Homily was stooping over the stove. There you go again, explained Homily, turning angrily, nearly pushing me into the soup. And when I say potato, I don't mean the whole potato. Take the scissor, can't you, and cut off a slice. Didn't know how much you wanted, mumbled Arietti. And Homily, snorting and sniffling, unhooked the blade and handle of half a pair of manicure scissors from a nail on their wall and began to cut through the peel. You've ruined this potato, she grumbled. You can't roll it back now in all that dust. Not once, it, not once it's been cut open. Oh, what does it matter, said Arietti. There are plenty more. That's a nice way to talk. Plenty more. Do you realize, Homily went on gravely, laying down the half nail scissor, that your poor father risks his life every time he borrows a potato? I meant, said Arietti, that there are plenty more in the storeroom. Well, out of my way now, said Homily, bustling around again. Whatever you meant, and let me get the supper. Arietti wandered through the open door into the sitting room. Ah, the fire had been lighted and the room looked bright and cozy. Homily was proud of her sitting room. The walls had been papered with scraps of old letters out of waste paper baskets, and Homily had arranged the handwriting sideways in vertical stripes, which ran from floor to ceiling. On the walls, repeated in various colors, these were postage stamps, excuse me. In various colors hung several portraits of Queen Victoria as a girl. These were postage stamps borrowed by Pod some years ago from the stamp box on the desk in the morning room. There was a lacquer trinket box padded inside and with the lid open, which they used as a settle, and that useful standby, a chest of drawers made of matchboxes. There was a round table with a velvet cloth, which Pod had made which Pod had made from the wooden bottom of a pillbox supported on the carved pedestal of a knight from the chess set. I wanted to show you, this is a picture, just a hand-drawn pencil type picture of what the room looked like. And I believe over here is Pod and And that is his wife. Excuse me. <clears throat> Homily is his wife. So, the pillbox supported on the carved pedestal of a knight from the chess set. This had caused a great deal of trouble upstairs when Aunt Sophie's eldest son, on a flying midweek visit, had invited the vicar for a game after dinner. A game of chess. Rosa Pickhatchet, who was housemaid at the time, gave in her notice. After she had left, 
other things were found to be missing and no one was engaged in her place. From that time onwards, Mrs. Driver ruled supreme. The night itself, its upper body, so to speak, stood on a column in the corner where it looked very fine and lent that air to the room which only statuary can give. And I'm going to try to show you right there, I believe, is the night that they are talking about in the corner of the room. Beside the fire in a tilted wooden bookcase stood Arietti's library. There was a set of those miniature volumes which the Victorians loved to print but which to Arietti seemed the size of very large church Bibles. There was Bryce's Tom Thumb Gazette of the World, including the last census, Bryce's Tom Thumb Dictionary, with short explanations of scientific, philosophical, literary, and technical terms. Bryce's Tom Thumb edition of the comedies of William Shakespeare, including a foreword on the author. Another book whose pages were all blank called Memoranda. And last but not least, Arietti's favorite, Bryce's Tom Thumb Diary and Proverb Book, with a saying for each day of the year, and as a preface, the life story of a little man called General Tom Thumb who married a girl called Mercy Lavina Bump. There was an engraving of their carriage and pair with little horses the size of mice. Arietti was not a stupid girl. She knew that horses could not be as small as mice, but she did not realize that Tom Thumb, nearly two feet high, would seem a giant to a borrower. Arietti had learned to read from these books and to write by leaning sideways and copying out the writings on the walls. In spite of this, she did not always keep her diary, although on most days she would take the book out for the sake of the saying, which sometimes would comfort her. Today it said, you may go farther and fare worse. And underneath, Order of the Garter, instituted 1348. She carried the book to the fire and sat down with her feet on the hob. What are you doing, Arietti? called homily from the kitchen. Writing my diary. Oh, exclaimed homily shortly. What did you want? asked Arietti. She felt quite safe. Homily liked her to write. Homily encouraged any form of culture. Homily herself, not very, un not very educated, could not even say the alphabet. Nothing, nothing, said Homily crossly, banging away with the pan lids. It'll do later. Arietti took out her pencil. It was a small white pencil with a piece of silk cord attached, which had come off a dance program. But even so, in Arietti's hand, it looked like a rolling pin. Arietti, called Homily again from the kitchen. Yes? Put a little something on the fire, will you? Arietti braced her muscles and heaved the book off her knees, and it stood upright on the floor. They kept the fuel, assorted slack and crumbled candle grease, in a pewter mustard pot and shoveled it out with a spoon. Arietti trickled only a few grains, tilting the mustard spoon not to spoil the blaze. Then she stood there basking in the warmth. It was a charming fireplace made by Arietti's grandfather with a cogwheel from the stables, part of an old cider press. The spokes of the cog head stood out in starry rays and the fire itself nestled in the center. Above, there was a chimney piece made from a small brass funnel inverted. This at one time belonged to an oil lamp which matched it and which stood in the old days on the hall table upstairs. An arrangement of pipes from the spout of the funnel carried the fumes into the kitchen flues above. The fire was laid with matchsticks and fed with assorted slack and as it burned up, 
the iron would become hot. And homily would simmer soup on the spokes in a silver thimble. And Arietti would broil nuts. How cozy those winter evenings could be. Arietti, her great book on her knees, sometimes reading aloud. Pod, at, at his last, he was a shoemaker and made button boots out of kid gloves. Now, alas, only for his family. And Homily, quiet at last with her knitting. Homily knitted their jerseys and stockings on black-headed pins and sometimes on darning needles. A great reel of silk or cotton would stand, table high, beside her chair, and sometimes, if she pulled too sharply, the reel would tip up and roll away out of the open door into the dusty passage below. And Arietti would be sent after it to rewind it carefully as she rolled it back. The floor of the sitting room was carpeted with deep red blotting paper, which was warm and cozy and soaked up the spills. Homily would renew it at intervals when it became available upstairs. But since Aunt Sophie had taken to her bed, Mrs. Driver seldom thought of blotting paper unless suddenly there were guests. Homily liked things which saved washing because drying was difficult under the floor where they had in plenty, hot and cold, thanks to Pod's father, who had tapped the pipes from the kitchen boiler. They bathed in a small tureen, which once had, which once had held, and I am so sorry, but it's French, pâté de foie gras. That is probably wrong. When you had wiped out your bath, you were supposed to put the lid back to stop people putting things in it. The soap, too, a great cake of it, hung on a nail in the scullery, and they scraped pieces off. Homily liked coal tar, but Pod and Arietti preferred sandalwood. What are you doing now, Arietti? called Homily from the kitchen. Still writing in my diary. Once again, Arietti took hold of the book and heaved it back on her knees. She licked the lead of her great pencil and stared a moment deep in thought. She allowed herself, when she did remember to write, one little line on each page because she would never, of this she was sure, have another diary. And if she could get 20 lines on each page, the diary would last her 20 years. She had kept it for nearly two years already. And today, 22nd March, she read last year's entry, Mother Cross. She thought a while longer, then at last, she put ditto marks under mother and worried under cross. What did you say you were doing, Arietti? Called Homily from the kitchen. Arietti closed the book. Nothing, she said. Then chop me up this onion, there's a good girl. Your father's late tonight. That's the end of chapter two. I know that sounded like a lot. Some of the other chapters are not this long. Um, I hope you'll join me. I know it seems like a lot. Um, there is a movie, The Secret of Arietti, based on this, but of course it kind of differs. Anyway, I hope to see you again. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great weekend.